right, Genesis 32. Genesis 32 and 33 are the, uh, have to do with the theme of reconciliation, namely the reconciliation between Jacob and Esau. As I said last week, chapter 32 is the first part of that story. It's all one story. Chapter 33 is the second part of it. So far in chapter 32 that we started last week, we have observed a reminder in verse 1. That was the first thing, a reminder. Verse 1 and 2, chapter 32, now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp, so he named the place Manam. The Lord is reminding, basically, to summarize this, he's reminding Jacob, hey, Lord, Jacob, I'm still with you. I'm going to continue to be with you. I never left you. You have nothing to worry about. As you journey home, he's returning home to Canaan from uh, Laban's house up north, and uh, he's, you're going to guard, the God's angels are going to guard you on the way. By the way, we have notes in the back for tonight. So it's a reminder there, and then there's a priority in verses 3 to 23, and the priority is this, in the Jacob's mind, as he's returning home, back to Canaan, he's thinking about something heavily weighing on his mind, he's got some unfinished business to take care of, that business is, I've got to be reconciled to my brother first. 20 years before, that when he had left home, he had deceived his brother twice, and his brother bore a grudge against him. His brother threatened to kill him, as a matter of fact, 20 years before. Now, 20 years later, he knows, I've got to get this right with my brother. Uh, this is going to be a difficult task, but I've got to reconcile. So what does he do? He takes three actions. First of all, he comes up with a strategy in verses 3 to 8. And we talked about this last week. I'm not going to read it again. Let me summarize. His strategy is to send messengers to his brother way down south in a place called Seir, He's going to send messengers to him as a way of reaching out to him. Hey, I'm, I'm here. I want to meet you. I want to get with you. And uh, he gets the only response the messengers come back with is this. Esau's coming with 400 men to meet you. Well, that's all he hears. Naturally, Jer Jacob is terrified uh, when he hears that response. He thinks the worst. He thinks, you know, I better take some action. So he divides his family into two parts. Uh, you have one group here, one group here. And if they, he figures if they attack one group, then maybe the other group can escape. That's the action he takes. But then he takes another action, a very important one. He cast himself upon the Lord. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, I'll read this. Uh, Jacob said, very important to this whole, uh, whole section, this prayer. Jacob says, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown your servant, for with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, you can see this, the fear coming out of him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. That's an honest prayer, if I ever, if I ever read one, very, a model prayer and a prayer of desperation, uh, but it's vitally necessary. He needs to commit a situation to the Lord. He does that, and that's always the way, by the way, to go in a crisis. If you're in a crisis, to, is to seek the Lord, cast yourself, cast yourself upon him. But that brings us to the third action tonight, and we'll start here. Tonight, he seeks to appease, in verses 13 to 23. He's going to appease his brother. Verse 13 says, so he spent the night there, then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milking camels, their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and he said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong? And where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob. It's a present sent to my Lord Esau. Behold, he's also behind us. Then he commanded this also the second and the third and all those who had followed the drove saying, after this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him. Key word there, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face, perhaps he will accept me. 
So the present passed on before him while he himself spent the night at the camp. So in verse 13, he says he spent the night there. We're going to find out in verse 22, that's at a location called the River Jabbok. We'll talk about that later, about 20 miles north of the Dead Sea. Now he's going to make what I think, what I consider, not everybody considers this, I consider this to be a wise, practical decision at this point. He's going to prepare a present, literally a gift for his brother Esau. This present is, des is designed to pacify, to appease his brother. Uh, it's a, the word uh, pr present here has to do with the idea of homage. He's going to pay respect to his brother by giving him this gift. He's, what he's doing, he's, he's extending an olive branch. It's a peaceful gesture. I, I want to make peace with you is what he's saying by having this gift ready. Now, some people think this is, they see this as more of a bribe than, a brand, than an olive branch, but I doubt seriously after that prayer he just prayed, I really personally don't think he's trying to bribe his brother. I think he's just taking appropriate measures to try to reach out to him. I mean, think about what he did to his brother 20 years earlier. He cheated him in two major ways. I mean, he, this was, what he did was brutal, honestly. I can't underestimate the pain <clears throat> that Jacob caused Esau when he, what he did earlier to him by stealing his birthright, by stealing the blessing. Again, I'm aware of the fact that the Lord had ordained this for Jacob, but not the way it came about in, in, in the sense of what I mean by that for you hyper-Calvinists out there. What I mean by that is Jacob's actions were wrong in the way he went about it. Okay, So he's aware. Jacob's very aware of what he did to Esau, very aware. And he's rightly bending over backwards to do what he can to reconcile to his brother. He stole the blessing. Now he's trying to restore what he can to Esau. Not giving up the blessing. Not doing that. He simply wants to be a blessing. Great difference to his brother now. Now some commentators feel like he is giving up the blessing. He's gotten all, acquired all his property. Now he wants to give up, give up a lot of it. But think about this. He couldn't give up the blessing if he wanted to. The Lord said, you're blessed. That's the end of the story. You can't give it up. I think what Jacob's doing is similar to what a character in the New Testament did. In and, and Luke 19, you may have heard of a character named Zacchaeus. Uh, and what do we know about Zacchaeus? We know, we know this much. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Everybody knows that. You should know it if you don't. But in addition, in addition to that vital information, other things we don't know, Jesus affirmed his salvation. He affirmed the salvation of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. He said about Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. And what fruit do we have of the salvation of Zacchaeus? Well, remember Zacchaeus in Luke 19 said this. When you get a chance, read Luke 19, I think 1 to 10, somewhere in there. Zac he said, Zacchaeus said, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give him back four times as much now, tax collectors back in the first century in Roman Empire, they never said that. They never said that. They were known for their greediness. They were out to get people's money any way they could, extortion, whatever it took. But this tax collector's heart has been changed because the Lord did a work of grace in him. And as a result, his heart has changed, and, and, and the, the change took place all the way through his heart to his wallet even. Boy, that's a change. He's willing to give up uh, money. Tax collectors back then were in the, in the business of ripping off people, and Zacchaeus is no different, as you can see by what he says here. But now, as a true child of Abraham, he wants to make restitution. And I think this is proper and right, what he did. He's not trying to buy off anybody. He's just trying to do the right thing. And I see Jacob doing something similar personally in Genesis 32. He cannot erase the past, but he can show his genuine repentance by doing something very tangible, so he goes all out. Just how all out is he going? Well, let's see. He gets together at least 550 animals. Did you see what I read in that passage there? 500, at least 550 animals plus. He gets together out of his whole flock. 550, think about that. that two, think about this list. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, again, 200 ewes. What if someone was going to give this to you? This is money back in those days. 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts. 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys, everything but a partridge in a pear tree, right? He gives them all kinds. He's got all these animals ready to go, 550. By the way, 
Of that 550, 490 are females. So that he's giving the gift that keeps on giving. They're going to have a lot of offspring. This is a tremendous gift. And he has a certain arrangement with these animals. He's got several groups. His, his idea is to have several groups of animals together, each group headed by one servant. And so he'll have a group of animals here. And when Esau sees this later on, a group of animals will, will meet with Esau, headed by, actually followed by a servant. Then there'll be a space between that and the second group of animals, another space with the servant and the animals, and another one like that, and so on. And so this is and so one, one uh, writer likened this to a, under waves. It's designed in such a way that when Esau sees all these animals, he's going to be inundated with wave after wave of animals. That's how he's going to see it. It's just going to be marching in front of him, marching by him, like, what is all this? You could compare it to a train. You ever been in a long train? You ever back in the Midwest, by the way? Uh, that's train central up there. Trains all the time going by, and people, we're always waiting for a train up there, and uh, tons of boxcars, and you're saying, when is this train going to end? Where's the caboose at? So people were always trying to get through the railroad crossings right before the train would come. They were constantly doing this all the time because they knew what was going to happen wait forever. Jacob's plan is to overwhelm his brother with his generosity. By doing it this way, each servant will repeat the message. Each servant, when, when, when Esau sees a servant and a group of animals, the servant's going to say, these belong to Jacob, and they're a present for you, Esau. And then he'll see the next group. And the guy's going to say, oh, these belong to uh, Jacob, and they're a present for you, Esau. And the next guy's going to say the same thing, repetitiously. Also, that 550 animals he selects out of all his total flock shows just how prosperous he is. The Lord has blessed him incredibly. And you, and it's, and you can see that through the numbers. Now, there's a term used, look at verses 20 and 21. There's a term used five times, I need to show you this, in verses 20 and 21. It's the word face. You're not going to see that in the NASB translation, but if, you were, if I were to read these two verses to you in a, a very literal sense, here's what it actually says in verse, um, verse 20. He says here, and you shall say, behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will cover his face, literally, with the present that goes before my face. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will lift up my face so the present pass before his face. Or you could just say it in plain English, like it says already. All this talk about face, the face has to do with appeasing or pacifying his brother with the gift of animals. If the gift appeases Esau, then Esau will lift up his face to Jacob. In other words, if, the, if, if he accepts this appease, appeasement, offer of appeasement, then he'll lift up his face, he'll, he'll accept Jacob, he'll approve of Jacob, he'll forgive Jacob, he'll receive Jacob. It's just the way the Hebrew people uh, they express themselves in situations like this. And the reason I break, bring up the word face is because it's used several times in chapter 32 and chapter 33. It's an important word in this context. You're going to see it again and again. Now, as I said earlier, commentators have looked at this passage from two, two different perspectives. Some see the old Jacob at work. Oh, this guy is just a trickster. He is going back to his old ways. He's devising plans of his own making. He's doing what Jacob does best. This is nothing more than a bribe. He's doing it his way. The other perspective is that Jacob is simply doing all he can to, to reconcile to his brother. That's his goal, reconcile. That's my perspective. And uh, since it's difficult, I'll tell you another reason it's my perspective. It's difficult in this passage to try to do a psychological evaluation of Jacob's mo motives. I don't see how I could do that. And, if, and we may be accusing him of something he never was guilty of if we go the negative way. He did pray in verses 9 and 12. Very serious prayer, very uh, a great prayer of commitment, and he asked God to deliver him. Then he prepares this gift. Maybe God gave him the wisdom to prepare this gift. I like John Calvin's take on this. He says, listen to this, it's a fault that too many, that it is a fault that is too common among people that when they have prayed to God, they then resort to some plan that is not of faith to accomplish what they prayed about. Half that was Calvin, half that was me paraphrasing Calvin. With this line of reasoning, Jacob would, have, would be trying to answer the prayer himself. He wouldn't be trusting God. He'd be praying and yet resorting to his own devices. That happens, by the way. That does, has ever happened to you? You ever prayed to God? Lord, I 
need this, I've got this issue, I've got this problem. And then what do you do? You kind of sweep that other rug and you try to figure it out yourself. Try to make it, out, make it happen yourself. We've got to be on guard against that. We have to trust God when we pray to God. <laughs> if we pray to God, let's trust God that he's going to work things out. However, we, could, we should also use whatever means God has given us. For example, if we're in need of finances, we could, there's nothing wrong with praying to God to meet our financial needs. But if we're praying, yet we're lazy and not willing to work for a living, then why should God answer our prayers? So Calvin goes on to say, Jacob was not praying and then resorting to a scheme. It's, it's, it's wrong to do that. He wasn't doing that. And I quote Calvin, he prayed, yet he did not omit the use of the means which were in his power while leaving success in the hand of God. Calvin prayed, and yet he used the means available to him. I have a gift I can give to my brother. Why not use it? I'll leave the success in the hand of God, and we'll go with that. Calvin goes on to say, but the, for though by prayer we cast our cares upon God, that we may have a peaceful and tranquil mind, yet this security should not make us lazy. In other words, there's nothing wrong with praying to God, to ask him for help, and then to prepare, uh, and then to do what we can within our power uh, to, to try and do what we can. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And what does Jacob do? He shows his contrite heart with his gift to his brother. He shows his contrite heart. This, is a, this person has been greatly offended. You have to keep something in mind. When, it, when there is a person, if, you've, if you or I have offended a person in the past, greatly offended them, we've hurt them, we should pull out all the stops if we have to to reconcile, whatever it takes. Why? Because Proverbs 18, 19 states this, a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. The word offended, a brother offended, a brother transgressed against, a brother sinned against, a brother you sinned against to the point of breaking that relationship, guess what? You have to pull out all the stops. For reconciliation. And so Jacob sends the animals and the servants that had to meet Esau. That is his priority. He's going home. He's going back to Canaan. He's returning. God said return to Canaan. He's doing that, but he knows I've got a problem to deal with first. I've got to do this first. Like we talked about last week in Matthew 5, you leave your uh, offering at the altar and then go first to reconcile to your brother. He wants to reconcile. He needs to reconcile, and he's on his way to do that. We have hurt people again. If we have wronged them, as I said last week, the only course of action is to make it right with them. And there's one last action Jacob takes. He crosses the river. Look at verse 22. Now he arose that same night, and he took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Now this river, I've gave you, I give you a little note. It's on your notes. Uh, a little uh, map on your notes, rather. This river called the Jabbok River runs west, and it empties into the Jordan River. And so what's happening is Jacob's family is up north. They're traveling south, traveling south, and they come across this river that runs east and west, Jabbok River. And during the night, Jacob helped his family to cross to the south side of the river. And that's what he's doing here in, in these verses. Now, from what I've read, this river flows, as I say, it flows west to the Jordan, but it's a fast-flowing river. However, it's a very shallow river, shallow enough to cross. In fact, one writer said it's, it's only hip deep and about 30 feet across. So in verses 22 and 23, give no indication of any danger that took place, of anything that happened at all that was bad. They got across, no problem. And when, and when Jacob, when everyone has crossed, Jacob is left alone, verse 24 says. Makes it clear that it's left alone. Now, whether he's on the south side of the river or the north side is unclear because of some of the statements that are made. That's not the issue anyway. What matters is, is that he's alone. And any questions we may have, why did he do that at night? Why did he send it? Why is he left alone? They're unanswered. We don't know. And contrary to what many people think, Jacob doesn't stay behind because he's a coward. That's not what he's doing. He does not send women and children ahead southward over the Jabbok, so he'll be ready to run and escape. That's not his plan. If he saw attacks to the rest of his family, he's not going to escape because if you read chapter 33, the first person who meets Esau is Jacob. He's going to be first in line, not last. And so all that has happened so far, if you run through the context is, in the last several verses, is in keeping with Jacob's priority to reconcile. This is his priority. Now, what happens next is totally unexpected. Thirdly, we have not only the reminder and a priority, we have a struggle. 
a struggle in verses 24 to 32. What kind of a struggle? Well, first of all, a physical struggle. Look at verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Now, in verse 8, Jacob was afraid that Esau might attack him. And uh, he will be attacked, but not by Esau. He is attacked by an unidentified man, verse 24 says. Now, don't jump ahead of the story. That's all we know in verse 24. It says a man wrestled with, with him. This is an unprovoked attack. Comes out of nowhere and begins wrestling. Jacob didn't start it. The man did, whoever this man is. And if you think this was not a real live wrestling match, think again. First of all, the word wrestle is used in verses 24 and 25. The wrestling here has to do with an embrace for the purpose of fighting. Really wrestling. It lasts all night. Now, when most people think of wrestling, what do they think of? The World Wrestling Federation, right? I'm not talking about Hulk Hogan here or Triple H or any of those guys. I'm talking about a real wrestling match, an all-night encounter, uh, uh, neither contestant willing to give up, real wrestling, physical wrestling, very wearing struggle, first of all. Secondly, it involved a physical injury. Yes, a physical injury. Verse 25, uh, he, it says that, uh, you know, when he, he touched the socket of his thigh. And so uh, that means he, he dislocated it. This is not play wrestling. It's deliberate. That was a deliberate injury on his part caused by the unidentified man. That word touch can either be a light touch or it could be a more aggressive touch uh, that can uh, do something severe, cause a severe blow to actually harm someone, to harm a person. And I think this is the more aggressive touch. Jacob is physically injured. The, thought, the so socket of his thigh, it says, seems to be uh, the ball and socket joint. Joint's dislocated. Many scholars feel like they call that a dislocated hip, something like that. I can only, now, I don't know anything about a dislocated hip. To this point, okay? I hope I don't ever know about it, personally. <laughs> but I can only imagine. I would think it's quite painful. But you can ask the medical experts in the room, not myself. I don't think it's a good thing, any way you look at it. But his opponent, whoever it was, must have been very strong. So this is a physical struggle, a physical wrestling match. Secondly, what kind of a struggle are we talking about? We're talking about a spiritual struggle. Look at verse 26. Then he said, let me go, for the, day, the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven or you have contended with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. There is a, you have to understand, there's a spiritual reason for this wrestling match. There are spiritual implications. There's a spiritual goal in mind. So physical, yes, but a physical wrestling match for spiritual reasons. Now, it's first of all necessary to know who both of these opponents are. We know one of them is Jacob, but who's the other? Who is the unidentified man in verse 24? Look at verse 30. God, uh, Jacob says, I've seen God face to face. So that answers the question, it's God. Think about this, God is wrestling with Jacob. Now, some things are beginning to make more sense, but other things are beginning to make less sense. Fortunately for us, there, we have a really good Bible commentary. <clears throat> By the way, I want to recommend everybody get this for your library if you don't have it. The great Bible commentary on this section is found in the prophet Hosea. Turn to Hosea chapter 12. Hosea 12, verses 2 to 4. Now, I don't have time to survey Hosea and all that, but we'll get the message from these verses. Look at Hosea 12, verse 2. Hosea 12, 2. <clears throat> the Lord has a dispute. I'm sorry, we're in the minor prophets. Let me give you some more time. The missing prophets, I should call them. <laughs> All right, we'll give you 10 more minutes, and then I'm going to start <laughs> quoting this, okay? Hosea 12, verse 2. The Lord also has a dispute with Judah. He will punish Jacob, which is 
a, a name often referred to that Israel was referred to by the nation is. He has a, a dispute with Jacob. Uh, he's going to punish Jacob according to his ways. He'll repay him according to his deeds. Verse 3, in the womb, he took his brother by the heel. Does that recall, do you recall that? Verse 3, and in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. So we have this commentary here. Now, Hosea is speaking of Jacob, and he's going back to two, two events in the past. First of all, at his birth, and then secondly, the wrestling match. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. Remember when he grabbed Esau by the heel in the womb back in Genesis 25? And in his maturity, he contended with God. The time of his maturity is Genesis 32. He's a man now versus the previous thought of him being a newborn. Uh, and he's still contending. By the way, Jacob's always contending with somebody. He's contending with God now this time. But what I want you to see is what verse 4 says. Look at verse 4. He wrestled with the angel and prevailed with the angel. So we have three clues now at this point. If we, if we look at these clues together, maybe we can find out exactly who Jacob is wrestling against. He's wrestling in verse 24 with a man. Secondly, he's wrestling with God, it says. Thirdly, he's wrestling with what's called an angel here. I can only conclude from this that he's wrestling with the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, the same one you see in Genesis 16, the same one you see in Genesis 18. The, Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared in human form on the earth in the Old Testament, and he's identified as God. Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord. So now we're able to piece some things together. We're able to learn some things about what the Lord is doing here. Number one, back to Genesis 32. Number one, it was the Lord that initiated the wrestling match. He initiated it. God is taking the lead. God wanted Jacob to wrestle him. Imagine that. God wanted Jacob to wrestle him. He drew him into the match. He starts it. And he, he wanted an encounter with Jacob because he know. He knew that Jacob needed an encounter with him. He knew that. By the way, the Lord's always the one to do this, always the one to initiate. Any spiritual, any true spiritual work that happens, God initiates. The Lord is always the one to do that. I didn't initiate my salvation. I didn't come looking for him. He came looking for me. As 1 John 4, 19 states, we have, we love him, or we love, or we love him. Why? Because why? He first loved us. He initiates all spiritual encounters. Now, I would not expect an, an, a man to appear out of the dark at nighttime to wrestle me. I hope you don't expect that. Now, if that happens to you, I would run as fast as possible. But God certainly has his ways of getting our attention, and he did here. Secondly, we learn that God injured Jacob. Think about that. God injured Jacob. The Lord did. Dislocated his hip. On purpose. Does it on purpose? That doesn't sound very nice, does it? Why would the Lord do that? Why would he do that? I think in order to weaken Jacob. In order to weaken him. Look at verse 25. When God, did not, when God didn't prevail against Jacob, when he saw he was not prevailing against Jacob, he thus then dislocates his thigh. When he saw he wasn't winning, we'll say, he dislocates his thigh. Now, let me ask this question. Is it really possible to prevail over God? Is it really possible to achieve victory over God? Did Jacob really win the wrestling match? Well, obviously no man can match God's strength or overpower him. The angel of the Lord saw his perseverance and he accommodated himself to him. That's what happened. Kind of like a father wrestling with his children. You've ever done that and you pretended you were on equal basis in some ways with them? Jacob persevered because God allowed him to. He wanted Jacob to to wrestle him. He wanted Jacob to, pursue, to persevere in his pursuit of God. He wanted that to happen. Now, I don't know at what point Jacob recognized the unidentified man as the Lord, but when he did, once he did, he sought his blessing. He clung to him tightly. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the way he prevailed was through perseverance. So what did we learn? The Lord wants us to tenaciously cling to him. He wants us to abide in him, to hold fast to him. And if we are clinging to him, it's not because we can overcome him. It's because he overcame us. He overcame us, our self-will. Remember, it's God who arranges this wrestling match. 
He weakened Jacob. Think about that. He weakened Jacob so that Jacob would have to depend upon him all the more. And that injury would become a permanent reminder that God had encountered him. He's never going to forget this. Matthew Henry says this. Listen carefully to Matthew Henry's statement. Wrestling believers, wrestling believers may obtain glorious victories and yet come off with broken bones. For when we are weak, then we're strong. We can ourselves strong in Christ. That's what the Lord wants from his people. He wants us to be weak in ourselves and yet strong in Christ. His grace is sufficient for us. His power is perfected in our weakness. And so the Lord injures him. Interesting thought. Thirdly, he, re, he renamed Jacob. He renamed him. Jacob insisted on being blessed. Uh, he held on to the blessing. He wouldn't take no for an answer. And God does bless him, yes. But how did he bless him? Well, the context has to do with the new name given him. Look at the end of verse 26. I, won't, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Immediately following that statement, there's the question in verse 27. What is your name? We're talking about a name now. He said, I want to be blessed. What's your name? My name is Jacob. Why does the angel of God ask his name? Doesn't he know what it is? He does, but he wants Jacob to reflect on his name and what it means. <clears throat> what does it mean? It means heel grabber. The one who grabbed the heel, Esau's heel in the womb, it means deceiver, supplanter. He's the one who deceived his father and brother. Remember what Esau said about him in Genesis 27? He said, isn't he, isn't he rightly named Jacob? His name is Jacob. He deceived me twice. That's who, he is. That's who Jacob is. That's the character he had. And God's been working on him for 20 years now. And now he's going to take him to the next step. Look at verse 28. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven, you've contended with God, you've fought with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, I know you probably read in years past, as I have, that the name Israel means prince with God, but modern scholarship has done much study on this, and there's the agreement that it technically means God fights. God fights. God contends. God uh, strives. That's the technical meaning of the name. The description in verse 28 is, is of one who is striven or contended with God. That's a play on Hebrew words. The, the word Israel, the word striven. God fights. Jacob fights. And God blesses the perseverance. But the whole verse says God has, Jacob has striven with God. And what else? And with men, both, God and men. What men is he talking about? Who does he strive with? Well, he's, he contended with Laban, for one thing. He contended, and he prevailed after the 20, it's quite the struggle for 20 years. And what about Esau? He has yet to contend with him. Will that be a wrestling match also? Will that be a, a problem also? Will that end in harm and death? An injury? This verse gives us a hint here. As Israel, Jacob will be victorious. He, he has survived his encounter with God, and now God will ensure he survives his encounter with his brother. Uh, and so I believe, honestly, as I thought through this, I believe this incident here is an answer to prayer. What prayer? The one in verses 9 to 12, I think that's key to this whole section. He prayed, God answered, this is part of the answer, and the rest in chapter 33 is the rest of the answer. Jacob also requests he knows that he know his fellow wrestler's name. I want to know his name. What's your name? He also asked the question. Look at verse 29. <clears throat> Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. You asked my name. Now tell me your name. Of course he knows he's God, but he wants to know, have more insight. But the angel of the Lord is not willing to give him that information. And he says, why do you ask my name? Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but when you get a chance, read Judges 13. Judges 13. The angel of the Lord appears in that chapter to people, and, and he has asked the same question Jacob asked here, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord replies in Judges 13, why do you ask my name? Same question, same answer. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful, or it is incomprehensible? If I were to tell you everything uh, the angel of the Lord is saying about me, you, would not, you wouldn't understand it anyway. There are things God has revealed to himself that we can understand. But there are other things that are beyond our comprehension. We're talking about an infinite God here. We can't put him in a box and try to make him uh, in the totality of his being and try to understand it all with our finite minds. It's impossible. Let his blessing be good enough. Let what we do know about him be good enough. But Jacob is anxious to give him a name to this place because 
of the tremendous impact it has on his life. So he calls it Peniel, which means what? The face of God. Here we go again with the word face. Peniel is, this, by the way, Penuel in verse 30, 31 is the same, same place. It's just a different spelling. He says in verse 30, I've seen God face to face. Again, he says it. And my life has been preserved. Now, when you read that, the first thing I thought was this. Doesn't the Lord say in Exodus 33, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my face and live? It does say that. But Jacob didn't see him in the fullness of his essential nature. He didn't see him like that. He saw the human-like appearance of God, the angel of the Lord, just like Abraham saw, just like Hagar saw. That's what he sees. So he's not, had he seen God in the fullness of his glory, he would have, been, he would have died. Jacob is not only given a new name, though, he's given a new stride. I like verses 31 and 32. Now the sun rose upon him <clears throat> just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, <clears throat> which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the hip. He's got a new stride, and it's not a great one. It's, it's the mark God left on him. God didn't give him eagle's wings to fly away to glory. He gave him a limp. He gave him a limp. And so Jacob uh, has another struggle. And so every step, think about this, every step that Jacob takes from now on is going to be a reminder of that encounter with God and of that encounter that God wanted him to be a changed man, one who's entirely dependent upon God. God heard him so he would be the man God wants him to be. The people at verse 32, the people of Israel even memorialized this occasion by a dietary restriction. They don't eat the tendon uh, muscle. They did that to honor the Lord, at least at the time of Moses they did it. So Jacob has met God face to face. So now he's prepared to meet his brother Esau face to face. Outside of that, he would not be prepared. The struggle, listen to this, the struggle was worth the blessing. Struggle was worth the blessing. So there's a reminder, there's a priority, there's a struggle. And lastly, there's a reconciliation in chapter 33. A reconciliation. Look at verse 1. Jacob lifted up his eyes. And he looked, and behold, Esau was coming. 400 men with him. Here's the moment of the truth. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. <clears throat> then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and wept. They wept. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids came near and with their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph came near and Rachel, and they bowed down. And he said, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, to find favor in, thy, in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. Jacob said, now, no, please, if now I have found favor in your sight, then take my present from my hand. For I see your face as one sees the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Please take my gift, which has been brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have plenty. Thus he urged them, and he took it. In the distance, Jacob, after his wrestling match, looks up in the distance, and he sees Esau coming. He sees the 400 men coming with him. So he divides his family into three groups. Now, this is not the same thing as before, back in chapter 32. He's not, this is not out of fear. This time, this arrangement is based on the fact that he now wants to meet Esau. And this effect, the, the grouping is based on his affection for family members from least to greatest. He has the least affection for the two maids and their children, so he puts them first in line. Then he has uh, the, the second uh, amount of affection for <laughs> Leah and her children, second place. And then thirdly, Rachel and Joseph. Rachel is still his favorite, his favorite wife. So he puts her in, in the third position, which is, okay, you're like the queen here. I'll let the other two go first, and then they'll, the queen will be third, and she's given the greater place of honor. Nothing's changed there at all. But what does grab our attention is this. Jacob is going to be first to greet Esau, first in line. Not last, not hiding somewhere. He's first in line. And as Jacob, as Esau approaches, Jacob knows what he does. He bows, bows down seven times. Now that's a, back in that day, that was a custom. If you bow down seven times, you're showing great deference, you're showing respect to your Lord, to a, a higher official, that is not the Lord, a higher official. 
And Jacob sees Esau this way. Jacob knows I've got to humble myself. I'm, I'm going to do this thing, and he does in light of what he did in the past. And he also continues to refer to himself as Esau's servant. Esau's my Lord. Very humble. Now, what is Esau's long anticipated reaction? Verse 4, look at all the verbs. He ran to meet him, he braced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. So Esau is running, he's embracing, he's falling, he's kissing, he's weeping. In fact, they both weep. It's a great emotional moment. Esau, overcome with emotion, very glad to see his brother. I think maybe Jacob, I don't know if he was shocked or not, or he just said, this is the way I know it's going to happen. But Esau says, well, who are all these people with you? Jacob says, God gave me. God graciously gave me these people. God favored me is the actual word. He favored me. Here, here's a new word coming into play here, the word favor. <clears throat> favor is key in this section. Notice Jacob does not say at this point the word bless or blessing. At this point, he doesn't say that because in regard to himself, he doesn't want to remind Esau, oh, remember the blessing? Oh, that's the one I stole from you. I'm not going to say that word. I'll say graciously given. I'll say favor. You favored me at this point trying to avoid any reminder of the past that right now. So the whole family bows down, everybody bows down before Esau in respect. Esau questions Jacob about the gift of the animals. Why did you send me all this, these animals? Be to find favor with you. That's why I sent you all these animals. Verse 10, Jacob insists that Esau take the gift because he says, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God, which he just saw recently. I want, again, the, the term face of God. Jacob had prevailed with God. Now he wants to prevail with his brother Esau. And acceptance of this gift by, es by Esau will now show that he has definitely accepted Jacob and the reconciliation. And now in verse 11, it's time to bring out the word blessing. Look at the NASB. Please take my gift. That word is literally blessing. Please take my blessing. I don't know why they didn't translate blessing. It's key to this passage here. Please take my blessing, which has, been, which has been brought to you. I'm bringing this blessing to you. I want to bless you, Esau. He's making it very emphasizing, very strongly. Forget about the blessing of the past. I'm here to bless you. I want to bless you. And so Esau accepts. And guess what? Reconciliation complete. They're, they're reconciled together. Amazing. Look at verse 12. Esau said, let us take our journey and go, and I will go before you. But he said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail. The flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. If they're driven hard one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord pass on before his servant, and I will proceed at my leisure according to the pace of the cattle that are before me and according to the pace of the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. Esau said, please, let me leave with you some of the chill people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor again in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on the way to Seir. Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and he built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock, and therefore the place is called Succoth. Now Esau suggests that he escort Jacob, which is refused. The reason given, he says, well, I, you know, I appreciate your offer. However, the children need rest. The cattle need rest. I can't overdrive them. We're going to take our time. I don't want to waste your time. So... Don't worry about it. And Esau persists and offers us help a second time. And Jacob says, we're good. Thanks for the offer anyway. Jacob does say this, I'll come down to Seir. Now, he never makes it down there. He doesn't go down to Seir where Esau lives. Was he lying? Was he up to his old deceptive ways? Well, I don't think so. It seems hard to believe after his prayer to God, after his, all this time of all this preparation, all this gift. I don't think he's trying to now deceive him after all this time of trying to get right with him. Maybe he planned on making the trip to one day to see her, just never made it down there. So I, again, I can't psychoanalyze his mind right here. Can't do that. Jacob has been told by the Lord to go on to go to his home again. He needed to reconcile to his brother. That happens. Now time to head home. In verse 17, he stops for a while in this place called Sukkoth. I don't know why. It doesn't say maybe he needed to nurse animals for a while. Maybe they retire from the journey. Maybe he needed to stay there for a while. Uh, and the children were tired, and so on. They eventually do leave. Look at verse 18. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram and camped before the city. He bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. 
So he moves to Shechem, which we'll talk about next week more, or a couple weeks from now probably. He built an altar, El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. Now, think back in Genesis, in Genesis 28. Jacob, at the, at the vision, at the dream of the ladder with the angels, he had made a vow to God, if God will be with me and I return to my father's house in peace, remember that? Then the Lord will be my God. And now he says he's returned to peace, and he says, in effect, the Lord is my God. All of it worked out. He's, in, he's the God of Israel. And so the Lord worked it all out. He brought about the reconciliation, but he also did a work in Jacob's heart. Now, here's the thing. Every one of us is like Jacob in this sense. Every one of us is hampered by our self-will. The Lord has to break us before he can really use us. He's got to break us first. We're full of, we've got all kinds of self-will, all kinds of pride, all kinds of things in our life, and God has to break us first. He has to bring us to the place uh, of, of total dependence upon him. And he's got to bring us to the place where we deeply understand our need of him. We deeply understand we need him desperately. So my encouragement tonight to you is to pursue, or persevere, rather, in your pursuit of God. Persevere in your pursuit of God. The Lord blesses his people, and here's why, so that they might be a blessing to others. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful tonight for your word again. We pray you'll help us uh, this coming week, Father, to be a blessing to others. Help us to pursue you, Lord. Our walk with you is often shabby and not serious. And we're, we're, our, we're, we're so controlled by self-will. We confess that as sin tonight. We pray we'll be surrendered to you, Lord, that you'll take us and use us for your honor and glory and for your purposes. We praise in Christ's name. Amen.